Um, about three months ago, yeah, three months ago, we conducted a survey and we asked folks, what are you really interested in hearing from um, organizations like Archaeology Southwest? And A number one at that top of the survey was news about recent archaeological research. So lucky enough, straight from the field tonight, um, we've got uh, the directors of the uh, UVA School of Anthropology's field school, archaeological field school at Guvavi, and they'll be sharing their story with you shortly. So without any further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Homer Thiel and Bardet Pavel Zuckerman to talk about the, the U of A's field school. <laughs> Um, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to sort of, uh, so the Guavavi Field School is a collaboration between three different uh, units or agencies. The University of Arizona, where I am faculty, um, Desert Archaeology, where Homer Thiel is, um, is, what is your? Ex I'm exactly? a senior project director. Senior project director. <laughs> and uh, the National Park Service. And we have a third collaborator, Jeremy Moss. Um, hang on. Um, who is archaeologist. Um, was archaeologist at Tumacacari National Historic Park um, until fairly recently. Um, so he is, he's not with us tonight, but there's three of us that have been involved in this project uh, since the beginning. So I wanted to talk, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk and then we're gonna take turns here. So Mission Guavavi was a Kino mission um, established by Father Eusebio Francisco Kino in 1691-ish. Um, but obviously there was a long history of occupation before Kino arrived. Um, Kino was also not the kind of guy that stayed in one place for very long, so he would basically go to these missions, he would drop off some cattle and some wheat and then move on to the next place. He would baptize some babies, sort of plant the Spanish flag, give it a saint's name and, and move on to the next place. So there were people living at Guavavi. There was a community of Atam ancestors that had lived there for um, uh, many, many generations and even long before that. Um, so one of the, the key questions that we were interested in at Mission Guavavi is um, first to understand the role of the mission in a colonial economy. So what was the role of this mission in the middle of southern Arizona in the Spanish program of colonialism? And then another question that we had was for the National Park Service was to understand the full history of occupation of Mission Guavavi, um, going back into the Hoacom and even earlier if we could show that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, but the mission itself, um, the sort of the peak of the mission period was about 1730 to 1770. After 1776 or 1775, uh, the mission was mostly um, uh, left. Uh, the people who had lived there moved on to, to Macaquery and then to Bach. Um, after at the end of the 18th century. So m the primary mission period that we're talking about is about 1730 to uh, 1770. Um, after the mission was no longer used as a mission, there was a reoccupation of the site by Yaqui miners, and we did find some evidence for mining activities and a Yaqui occupation in the 19th century, so in the early 19th century um, at Mission Guavavi. So we're talking about um, at least um, probably 4,000 years of occupation at the mission. What people know it most for is the, is the Spanish colonial um, occupation, but that only lasted really about 40, 50 years. There was a much longer history of occupation at the site. So I'm gonna turn it over to Homer to talk about some of the archeology span that had been done at the project, and then I'll come back in and tell you about our field school. So in uh, 2011, Desert Archeology span got a contract to do a study and a map mapping program at Calabasas uh, Mission, which is one of the three units of the Tumacacari National Historic Park. And at that site, we laid out a grid within the, the, if you've been to Calabasas, you know that there's a big fence around it to keep people out. And we laid down a grid and we crawled around on our hands and feet and uh, picked up every single artifact and counted them and, and made maps. But we realized relatively quickly that we would have enough money left over on the project to do a map of Guavavi. So we went over there and we mapped Guavavi, and that's the map that you have on your table. And one thing we noticed was that uh, there were uh, things happening that were damaging the archaeological resources. In the road that runs through the site, uh, we could see that vehicular traffic and, and just regular erosion was damaging prehistoric features that were showing up as dark stains or uh, piles of rocks from roasting pits in the road. <clears throat> there was a uh, Spanish uh, period adobe structure, at least what's, that's what, what was thought, feature 20 on the map, if you can find it. That's kind of like, uh, where's Waldo? Where's feature 20? <laughs> Um, and, and the road going into the park ran right across the northern portion of that. 
And then in the actual, uh, these two uh, areas were in the city of Nogales' property because they own about 32 acres of the site. And then on the eight acre National Park Service area, there is a large midden off the side of the hill uh, or terrace, uh, feature 26 on your map if you can find that. And we uh, could see that it was being really actively burrowed in by rodents and other animals. And there were a lot of artifacts being kicked up. And uh, so we decided that it would be, uh, we recommended in the report that, hey, maybe sometime in the future, some sort of archeology span could take place to mitigate these damages that are occurring at the site. And that's where Jeremy Moss, the National uh, Park Service archeologist at Tumacocri at that time comes in. And he called up Barney and said, hey, well, how about doing a field school? So back in 2013, we had our first field school there. Back to Barney. <laughs> so um, as Homer pointed out, this started out as um, a project that Desert Archaeology had sort of identified as, as needing to get done. And then the Park Service approached the university about perhaps doing this as a field school. So um, our, the original impetus was to look at some of these contexts that are being um, that are, are threatened by certain uh, disturbances like rodent disturbance as well as vehicular traffic. So things are being run over um, as we speak, <laughs> quite possibly. Um, so uh, the opportunity to uh, work on National Park Service land um, was pretty huge and that was a really big draw initially. Um, getting to work on federal property is, is uh, logistically really challenging and to get permission is, is often very difficult. So it was kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to work on National Park land. The other side of the story then, as, I, as, um, as we mentioned, is that the entire site is, takes up about 40 acres, and that includes um, a pretty substantial prehistoric component that Homer will talk about. But the Park Service only owns about eight acres of that, of that massive site. Um, the rest of it is owned by the city, um, but the city and the Park Service are interested in getting some sort of agreement or even a land ownership change of the remaining 32 acres so that the Park Service can um, take care of those cultural resources as well. So in order to do that, though, in order to make a case with the Federal Lands Office, they need to know really w what's out there. And so Homer's work with Desert Archaeology before our field school um, helped them, but then really getting in there and doing some archaeology to figure out, especially in these endangered contexts, to see what's there and what's being lost is really critical to making that case. So that from an, um, from an academic standpoint, this collaboration between Desert Archaeology and the National Park Service and the university is incredible. Our students, this is now our third um, field school, the undergraduates and graduate students that we work with get a sort of front row seat at understanding the sort of major industries in which archaeology is carried out in the United States. I'm also half time in a university museum and so I also bring the sort of museum experience. So they've got a traditional academic archaeologists, archaeologists in a museum, archaeology and cultural resource management companies, and then also in federal agencies. So it's a huge learning experience for um, our students. And we also, by working with National Park Service and Desert Archaeology, we also get to use the resources and the university as well and apply for grants to the National Park Service. And um, we also got funding through the Western National Parks Association, which wouldn't not have been accessible to us unless we were working in um, a national park. Um, and then using the you know university resources and the resources that Desert Archaeology has to offer, which are, are substantial, has been a re really huge um, help to the, the project. Um, I also need to acknowledge a few other um, donors and sponsors or supporters. Um, this, we camp over spring break um, each year. We spend eight days camping at the Santa Fe Ranch and they're wonderful hosts and allow us to camp with them and, and use their property um, for free. Um, the, the Tona Atham Nation provides site monitors. Um, each year we've had, we had three the first year, two the second year, and, and one this year um, who have been out with us. And that's been a huge um, benefit to us um, the, the, to me, for my students, there's really no better education on the importance of archaeology and responsible archaeology and, and the impact that archaeology can have on living populations as having the descendants of the people who are living at that site working alongside you. So that's a huge benefit too for our students and for me as somebody who wants to um, raise <laughs> ethical archaeologists. Um, and um, I should also acknowledge Archaeology Southwest um, Carly and Doug have been working on a project, a 3D visualization project. Carly's behind the camera here um, on, on Guavavi. And so they've gotten some amazing preliminary results and they're, they're doing this. This is part of her internship, but Doug is providing um, this amazing service to see what Guavavi 
looks like in 3D without having to go to the site. And pretty soon we'll see what it might have looked like um, above ground. Um, and of course the city of Nogales has been very helpful in allowing us to work um, on city property and very supportive of what we're doing. Um, and I also want to mention that we have funding through the Home Office of the National Park Service in D.C. And that goes along with um, a, a Latino initiative, part of their Latino initiative, um, which is to bring high school students and teachers of, of Hispanic heritage to work with us at, at Wavavi. And so um, we have a, two years now we've had students um, from the local high schools um, come with us and, and get experience doing archaeology and the National Park Service is supporting that program and also therefore supporting our field school. So we're grateful to the Home Office as well as to McCockery National Historical Park, which has of course been our partner since day one. Um, oh, so related to that, the, uh, the Environmental Education Exchange has been our partner in running the Latino Initiative Project, which is called Linking Hispanic Heritage Through Archaeology. Um, and then I should also acknowledge we have a, a separate high school teacher who has been working with us on a um, looking at chemical signatures in cattle teeth from Guavabi, and that was supported by um, an Arizona Partners in Science grant through Research Corporation. So um, we've been piecing together the funding for field school through a number of different sources, and um, it's really been amazing to work with all these different partners. Yes, okay. archaeology is very expensive, and you have to like beg for money from everybody. Yes. Right. So I'll pass Every the hat around. Bit helps. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to actually pass something around at this point, so you guys can all see it. It's a Riker mount of some pretty artifacts that we found at the site. On this side, the left side, is a green glass arrow point. It is the, the one of three known for the state of Arizona. And it was made probably from a, a wine bottle from Europe sometime in the 1700s. And on the other side is uh, one, uh, these are Pima, Subipery Piman points. On the other side is a regular stone one. And in the center is a piece of a uh, glazed olive jar, which is a some mis missionary at the uh, uh, at the mission was like, I want a bottle or a big thing of olive oil or wine, and so they dragged this up there on um, a mule back or horseback or in a freight wagon, and somebody dropped it and broke it and left it behind. So I'll pass these around so you guys can see these. So um, uh, on your map, let's see if I can do another where's Waldo um, in the roadbed we could see things and one of them was uh, feature 29 um, which is uh, well you can find it um, we could see on the road there were several roasting pits that were visible there are circles of rocks with dark charcoal stained earth and then around them were these larger sort of oval to rectangular stains on the road surface, they're charcoal stained and there were, of course, pottery sherds coming out. And so we suspected that they were uh, pit structures. Um, and in the last three years, we put uh, excavation units, I think, into five or six of them. Leslie, who is back there, uh, just finished working in uh, the best preserved one, actually, and determined that, yes, there were Holocom pit structures there and that they dated from roughly about AD 900 to AD 1100. And it's a very substantial village at this location, one of the two or three largest villages between, uh, well, if you go a little bit south of Tucson, say between Green Valley and the international border that we know about. Uh, we found evidence for trade. There was shell jewelry in, in the structures, and uh, we had pottery from at least the Gila River, perhaps the Phoenix Basin, and we had pottery uh, from what is now modern Sonora. Trincheras polychrome and Nogales polychrome. So uh, although it's, it's, there's very little evidence of this village elsewhere, we think it's probably fairly large uh, on the landscape. Um, and it just happens that the road cut, it, it, you know, it's cut down about maybe this far below the modern surface has cut down into the areas with the pit structures and allowed us to see them at this location. We were hoping we would find uh, evidence for early agricultural period village uh, because there are lots of points from that time period showing up in the mission area. But we think what's happening is when they built the mission, they went down to the river bed to mine out dirt to make the adobe bricks and they were mining into uh, an early agricultural period site and pulling up the flake stone and the uh, arrow points and the spear points and uh, they end up in adobe bricks and that's how we're finding them on the site because we have not found any on this terrace above the river. Uh, so that was one of our questions that didn't get answered the way we wanted to but it, uh, 
you know, that's the way archaeology is. <laughs> so in our first season um, at Guavavi, we were um, permitted to work on National Park property in what was the Mission Midden. Um, and we put in two what, two a, by... What's a midden? Oh, sorry. A mi <laughs> thank you, Homer. Um, a midden is basically the trash heap. So we were allowed to dig in the trash um, of the mission. So we put in two units that were two meters by two meters square. Um, we were able to work there because rodents have really been kind of digging things up. It's a bit of a mess. And um, even this year we were back and they've done even more... <laughs> more work <laughs> in the midden. Um, so the working in the in the midden was an incredible opportunity to for for me in terms of my research interests in terms of understanding um, the economy of the mission and um, also the role of domesticated animals, which is my particular research area. Um, we found something like forty thousand bone fragments um, in these just two by two two, basically a four by four meter area. No, just four. two by two meters. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> that was, um, yeah, that's a lot of bone. Um, so I have a graduate student, Nicole Mathwick, who's working on the analysis of, of the animal bone from, from uh, the min. Um, this is primarily cattle. Um, and what I'm interested in is knowing whether they were maybe using these animals for things other than meat, like tallow, which is an, a research area of mine. But what surprises people is um, the sort of international uh, products that we find um, in the mission min. Um, going around is the, the Spanish olive jar fragment. Um, we also found, not surprisingly, um, Mayolica from Mexico. That doesn't have to go too far. We found beads from either Czechoslovakia or Venice in the Midden. And I think most surprising to people um, who um, don't have experience in the, the Spanish colonial era is we found fragments of Chinese porcelain. And this was not the first porcelain that was found at Guavavi. Earlier archaeologists had found those as well. So um, what sort of blows my mind is that, you know, Chinese imports is, is not a new thing to southern Arizona, right? We have Chinese imports in 1750 um, here in southern Arizona. And to me, what that does is kind of brings home um, that even in the 18th century, what we had was a sort of a double transoceanic trade that we sort of think as being unique to our era, but really goes back to 1750. So you had materials coming from the Pacific trade as well as from the transatlantic trade, all making their way to um, southern Arizona in the 18th century. Um, I think when people think about missions, they often think about them as being these sort of isolated frontier outposts out in the middle of nowhere, led by these sort of intrepid missionary heroes, um, but, you know, without sort of understanding their role and their connections to all the other uh, Spanish colonial entities in this region and, and the other, um, you know, native populations in this region, we're not really understanding their place in, in these relationships. So getting to see sort of firsthand, the stuff is coming from all over the world. This sort of modern world economy, as we're experiencing today, um, really has its origins back into the 18th century and even earlier. Um, so that just kind of uh, blows my mind. The other side of it that I think is a little bit funny, too, is that um, it, how important it was for the, the presumably the, the priests at the mission to have, I, I suppose, the trappings of what they thought was um, sort of decent, civilized life, right? That to the extent to which they would go to get something like Chinese porcelain. So Chinese porcelain made its way to southern Arizona via the Philippines, which had a long um, tradition of trading um, with the Chinese mainland. So Spanish galleons, um, the Philippines was a colony of Spain at this time period, would land in the Philippines, pick up Chinese porcelain, they would ship it to the coast of Mexico, you know, via ship. Um, and it would be loaded onto mule trains and, and shipped to Mexico City, and then another mule train up to southern Arizona. So that's a hell of a journey. Um, for Chinese porcelain. Um, and you see the Spanish missionaries, that, or actually they weren't Spanish, the missionaries who were at this Spanish um, mission uh, complaining about their sort of life and you know dying in, in spades from various diseases like malaria. Um, but, so they, and they might not have been happy about the kinds of foods that they were eating, but damn it, they were eating on Chinese porcelain. They had their teacups, right? So to me that sort of brings home, you know, the, the missionaries were often the second-born sons of, of wealthy families, and so they were used to a certain existence in Europe, right? And so the extent to which they were willing to go to try to replicate that um, here in, in southern Arizona is, is pretty remarkable and, and also a little bit amusing. <laughs> There's, um, uh, I just saw a book review that described uh, uh, letters written by one of the priests at Guavavi, and he uh, talked about uh, it took him 
three years for his family to send him a uh, box of stuff from Europe. Three years. And when it got to Govavi and he opened it up, he discovered that some other priest had gone through it and stolen a bunch of the stuff. And how disappointed he must have been to open that box up and all the stuff that had been promised that he'd asked for. Because he'd, he'd send these whining letters back to Europe saying, please send me this. And then to open it up and not be there, that would have sucked. His broken teacups, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> what we're finding. <laughs> so the uh, second area that we l l worked in uh, in the first two years of our field school was feature 20 on your map. And this was the Spanish structure that was in the roadbed. And the first thing that we did was scrape the actual roadbed, and we discovered 13 courses of adobe bricks that had fallen over from the north wall of the structure and were lying uh, short side up on the road. You could see them uh, cut through. And then we located the north wall of the structure, and then we dug uh, a section along the north wall, and then last year we dug another section on the other corner of the room. And what we discovered was, uh, here, here, the big question was, was this a Spanish church or not? Um, on the ground surface, you could see that it looked like it had three or four rooms, but it wasn't really super clear. But when we dug into what turned out to be the northern room of the structure, we discovered, first of all, the walls had fallen outwards, which was nice because we didn't have to dig through piles of adobe bricks. And that the structure at, at the very end of its use, or maybe a little bit afterwards, had burned. And in the process, uh, the mud roof had fire hardened, and we had these big chunks of mud with the impressions of the roofing materials that had fallen down into the room. Underneath that was the actual burned beams, the vigas running across the room. And below that was a layer of, of silty dirt that had either blown in from the open doorway or possibly had, uh, as the dirt roof had sort of disintegrated and eroded into it, had fallen down in, and there were cattle bones um, on there, so we knew that, of course, immediately when you have cattle bones that it was Spanish period. And then we took that out and below that on the floor surface we found uh, shell beads from a little bead necklace, a piece of Mexican Mayolica pottery, and a couple of Piman arrow points. So it was definitely a mission period. In terms of the architecture, we discovered that, yes, it was a, a room in a set series of rooms, there was a doorway on the west side that was blocked up by large boulders. And in the 1960s, uh, the University of Arizona had done excavations within the, uh, what's now the Park Service area, within the Convento complex for the mission. And they had found a similar room where when the people had walked away and left it, they had blocked up the, door, the doorway of this room with large boulders. Um, because of what, what we found, we were able to determine that yes, it was not a, uh, a church, that it was a dwelling, and uh, the doorways faced the actual mission, and most likely it was the residence of some of the Native Americans and uh, possibly even the Mexican-American people living at the mission site during the course of its occupation, and that after the mission was abandoned, the building caught on fire somehow or was set on fire. The Apaches liked to burn down that sort of thing, and uh, fell down in. and. Uh, there's, there's, uh, we, we only dug a very small portion of that area, and someday some archaeologists will come with their laser trowel and figure out what we didn't dig up. <clears throat> so um, one of the advantages of working with a company like Desert Archaeology is not just that I get to work with Homer, but that yeah, I get to advantage. use the big advantage. Um, some of the, the resources that Desert has that the university doesn't have, um, such as an aerial drone. So in 2013, um, Homer's colleague Mike Brack sent a, a drone over the site and took aerial photographs. Um, and when we got them back, we got a big of a bit of a shock. Um, in the area, you see two green areas on that map, feature 18 and feature 19, that are called clearings. Archaeologists had sort of noted that there was kind of something funny going on in that area. It looked, the soil was light and fluffy in color, um, and there's, th it's just very different, the, the texture and the, the um, color of the soil is very different. The plants that are growing there are slightly sparser, a little bit different than what you see around in the surrounding areas. But nobody noticed really anything else other than, well, this looks funny, let's write it down on the map. So when we got the aerial photographs back, we could see clearly in those two areas lines of green um, on the ground. And these are plants that had grown up in very linear arrangements on the surface of the ground. 
And when we went out there, okay, so now we're like, what is this? You know, from the air, it looks like a, like a multi-room adobe compound structure, right? Okay, so let's go out and look at it. And it wasn't until you were right on top of these little tiny lines of plants that you could actually see these linear arrangements. So yeah, there's something there, there's something there. So in 2013, we figured out, okay, there's something here. Of course, the aerial photography was one of the last things that we did, in, or at least the results we got back on one of the last days of field school. So too late to do anything about it in 2013. So in 2014, we went out and fully expecting to find lots of adobe bricks. Um, and what we found was actually <laughs> sort of the, the, the negative of adobe walls. We found um, throughout this area, about 10 centimeters down, sometimes it's shallower, about five centimeters down, um, a hard layer, almost like concrete. Um, and it is solid, it looks vaguely like caliche, but it is not caliche, it's not carbonate, um, now that we've done some tests on that. And this whole hard layer, like a, like a layer of concrete about 10 centimeters down, is cut through um, with trenches. And Yeah, do you want to be Vanna? Sure. To Homer's going to be Vanna. Wait. So these black areas here are trenches that are cut through this really hard layer. And then in the trenches we could find um, post holes. And Lisa, who was our, one of our field school students in the second year, found the only burned post. So thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, so the, we found actually a burned post inside these trenches, which indicates, in addition to the post holes, that there were posts set into these fences, or into these trenches, which suggests that there were some, some fences built out here. We also found in the middle of the, the hard, concrete-like layers, post holes that maybe were dug through or perhaps the layer formed around um, individual posts set into this, this area. So what we think is going on here is that um, this is not probably a living quarters, but probably a corral structure for, oh, hey, that looks good, Homer. Yeah. Um, for, <laughs> uh, for livestock. And this is just one area of what is really a massive feature. So we have one area, feature 19, that looks very large and open. Perhaps that was for horses. In feature 18, we find a lot more internal walls and trenches that might be smaller pens for smaller livestock or for um, you know, management purposes. Um, and Homer's outlined, oh yeah, Homer's outlined what we think might be alignments that sort of make sense in terms of maybe shade structures, ramadas that were out there. And then, yeah, <laughs> and the orange um, uh, circles that he's pointing out are what we think are um, hoof prints in a muddy paddock that somehow got frozen in time. And we have no idea how this would have worked, but everybody who goes out there says, yeah, it looks like a muddy paddock that somehow just got stuck. Um, there's definitely sort of individual, you know, you know, hoof prints where an animal stepped into mud and then went back out and left a little divot. Um, and we had several ranchers come out and look at it too, and they, they agreed with us, so we felt pretty good about that. And you can see too that in some areas the, the muddy um, hoof prints or the, the hoof print area is sort of separated by what looks to be a fence line. Um, and so that would sort of uh, lend some support to our idea that this was um, an area in which corral were kept and there was a fence there that kept them out of the, the flatter areas. But in the area that's um, down below, this is just perfectly smooth. I mean, it's almost like, well, not perfectly smooth, but you could certainly dance on it. Not that we did. Um, so what we think is this is a mission era corral. Um, the Spanish olive jar fragment that's going around was found in feature 18, so that places it um, as mission period. We also found um, livestock bone um, and the green glass projectile point that was going around was also found in the, in the corral area. Um, and as was the other projectile points. So all three of those objects are from this corral, which um, places it firmly within the mission period, which is exciting. And the other amazing thing is that we don't know of any other mission period livestock features from um, at least from the southwest. There might be one outside of um, Santa Fe, um, but this would be really a first for this part of the world. Um, we just don't know anything about the sort of hinterlands of the missions. There's so much emphasis has been placed on the sort of central compound, you know, where the church is. And really people, archeologists, hadn't historically been interested in the landscape and um, the sort of broader landscape of, of impact that these missions had and, um, you know, the, the features that were built by, by people for livestock. So that's kind of a um, amazing uh, result that we were not expecting. But of course, as a zooarchaeologist, somebody who's interested in, in human use of animals in the past, this is really exciting. Uh, one, one aspect of this is that uh, because the site was never really occupied again after the 
uh, Yaki miners were there in the 1810s. Uh, it didn't get disturbed, and plus the hard surface preserved it. At other mission sites, like at San Javier or here in Tucson at San Augustine, things happened like they turned it into a dump or there's a parking lot on top of it. And so the preservation here made this a very special place. Um, we, we dug a separate block in another area, and um, we have a, you have a student, Kristen, who is doing her honors thesis. She did, yeah. Last she year. did. Mm -hmm. And she looked at uh, a digitized, uh, a, well, looked at area photographs in, in southern Arizona and northern Sonora, found corrals and pen areas, digitized them, and she was able to say things like, you have uh, pens for the animals, you have larger corrals, and you have chutes to manage the cattle and sheep, moving them through areas. And so in this particular picture, this uh, thing right here might be a chute where you'd run sheep in to individual pens to shear them, to castrate them, to uh, get them set up to butcher. Um, and then you have the individual pens of various sizes. Some of them are quite large and some of them are quite small. Um, all of which was something that we never knew about before. And she, when she looked at the sort of known historic corrals and compared to what we had, this particular area, this part of Feature 18, she thought that this area was more consistent with sheep pens, which is really interesting. Um, and that maybe Feature 19, which she didn't look at because we just worked on it this year, uh, might be for some of the larger livestock. So yeah. that would be really pretty cool if we could actually identify the species based on the size of the enclosures. Um, so that's pretty wild. She really, that was an incredible... Yeah. Um, creative approach to to this this problem and we did have both sheep and cattle bone found right. in these uh, trenches cattle is by far more numerous um, but that's because sheep um, many of them were allowed to live to a longer age because they weren't used necessarily just for meat but also for wool and so the opportunity that one sheep has of leaving an archaeological record um, is less than cattle or a cow that's killed, those, those animals are killed between two and three years, right? Where a sheep might be allowed to live a little bit longer. Um, but we know that they were introduced and in early on were actually found in equal numbers um, at, at Guavavi. And then over time, we see a gradual shift towards uh, cattle ranching over sheep ranching. So uh, this is our third and final year of the field school. And each of the years, uh, the students uh, have been working on papers and uh, we are working on compiling them into a final report and uh, it should be published sometime in the next year or so. As part of Desert Archaeology's technical report yep. series. So the students will actually get authorship credit on a CRM report, which is really huge for them. Yes, so they can put that on their resume when they apply to graduate school. And actually, one of the students from last year actually came and worked for us for over the summer. So you, uh, if you're a really good student, I'd hi I'll hire you. So. <laughs> All right, well, that's good. Um, I guess now it's time for questions. Okay, um, I, lots of questions already. I just want to make one quick point. Um, now and back in 2013, it was actually illegal to use drones to do any sort of archaeological photography. So if the FAA comes asking, where's a kite? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't, no, a, okay. that wasn't it a was, remote control It was drone. legal in 2013. It, it was legal and it was not for, we were not paying him to do it. That so. doesn't, right. that doesn't, it was perfectly legal that, in 2013. No, it, actually it doesn't matter. It was illegal. <laughs> oh, well. So if the FAA comes calling, it was a kite. <laughs> it was a kite. Okay, first question over here. I'm probably the only person in the world interested in this. But it, you said you were a livestock, uh, your, your specialty or your, one of your research interests was livestock. Is there, is there evidence that the cattle that were used at this site were Bos Indicus or Bos Taurus, versus European versus Asian sourced? I mean, where did these cows come from? Um, so we I mean, could you, the skeletal remains were sure. identifiable such? And there's at least one other person in this room that is very interested in this topic, and that's Chris Zuter, who's also a archaeologist. Um, so in terms of our identifications, we're not able to say what, um, what breed or what population they would have come from. Um, they're, they're both tourists, but that's what zooarchaeologists identify all cattle in, in the Americas as being, right? Um, so, but the cattle that were introduced um, from the, to the coast of Mexico, there was a pretty small herd initially that was introduced in 1503, I believe, was the first cattle um, on sort of mainland North America. Um, those came from Spain. Um, we tend to refer to those as criollo, criollos, that, that sort of, it's kind of a non-breed, but we call it a breed. <laughs> So we presume that these were criollos. 
Um, one of my sort of long-term interests with collaborators um, elsewhere is to perhaps run the genetics of some of these animals to see if we can figure out what they were. Um, and also to compare to some of the Spanish colonial cattle in the southeast and also English colonial cattle as well. But we generally refer to these as being criollo. But if you're getting, if you're getting plates from the Philippines, that's a good thought. We don't have any evidence of that in any records. Um, the records we have were that there was a, a group that was brought from Spain, um, and that was sort of the founding population. So it's possible, but it would certainly we could certainly look at that if we had access to the DNA. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, maybe. You have to find whole teeth. That's one of the problems. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I believe we had a question over here. I'm interested in that hard surface that you had in the uh, corral or the animal pen. So what was its purpose and from what was it made? Well, that's the big uh, question. Barney took acid and dropped acid on it. She dropped some acid, <laughs> yes. Um, and it didn't, it didn't fizzle or anything. So it's not, uh, it's not calcium carbonate like caliche. Um, the question is whether that hard surface was already there when they came and they utilized it for their uh, pen or sheep areas or, or whatever, or did it form while the animals were there? Perhaps when the animals urinated on the surface, uh, whatever it made it hard? We don't know. So, and we took samples of that, um, of that layer, and it's actually in Germany. Um, with, a, with a former graduate student, an alum of the University of Arizona School of Anthropology. And so she's going to thin section it and look at it under high power magnification and hopefully tell us what on earth it is. Um, and then we have a, a local soil guy, um, Jeff Homburg, who's uh, also looking at some of that soil as well. So hopefully between the two soil studies, we'll get some answers, but we really don't know. It's, it's a total mystery. I can't, I can't imagine people cutting through this stuff, frankly. It's, it's very hard. It's like concrete. I Which mean, is we good. Can't. When you yeah, have fresh could. students who have never dug before, it's, <laughs> it's great because they, they know exactly when to stop. It's true, actually. Yeah, yeah it's perfect. We did not, they did not dig through that layer. I thought that's what Homer was going to say. But I think the much. next question was here. What were the features that identified the Yaki mining <clears throat> component? Was it ethno-historical or what? Um, we found on top of what was clearly the mission um, trash, we found a layer of slag, so leftovers from mining, and we also found one or two pieces of English porcelain that date to the 19th century, and then also um, Native American ceramics. And so that suggested to us that this was a Yaqui reoccupation. And we know from the historical record that there were Yaqui miners that moved into that area during the early 19th century. So it, that's what we are pretty sure is um, happening, at least in the, la the top 20 centimeters of the mid. There's not any like, Yaqui ceramics or not that we were able to identify. No. The English ceramics, it was illegal to have English ceramics in this area up until the Mexican independence of 1821. And then afterwards, uh, England started trading with Mexico, and so that's why we have some English transfer prints. And illegal doesn't necessarily mean not here, but um, in this case, we just don't see it at all until, until that time period. Feature 19, uh -huh. you, do, you, do, you haven't excavated that, is that right? We did, it just was very boring, so we didn't bring any illustrations of that. It, okay. there, this is a, probably a, um, like a, either um, horse or um, maybe cattle, really yeah. wide open. So there just wasn't a lot of trenching. There weren't like small sort of pen areas. No. It was just really wide open with just a perimeter fence. And so we didn't bring any pictures of that. Uh, there were, there were uh, one area with little post holes, maybe for a ramada, and we had the animal footprints in another area. Um, and one aspect of these trenches is that it allowed you to set posts into the ground, and then you, they, they didn't have barbed wire back then, so they were weaving mesquite uh, branches and that sort of thing and creating a solid fence. And by setting it down into these deep trenches, it uh, would help prevent wolves and coyotes from burrowing into these areas. And if these were little pens where sheep or cattle were giving birth, and uh, that would be very important to help protect the, the young. And we also found this year um, rocks that had been placed at the base of the post to maybe bolster them. Um, and that was only in one area. We didn't find that elsewhere. So that might indicate to some a time component that might have been built later. But. I just wondered about the circular nature that uh, that's on the map. Is that 
an accurate representation? Like, could it be a round pen or something? Yeah, it's it like looks. That. We we're only really able to find one side of it. It's sort of it's hard to identify on the, on the other side, but it does look pretty long, and um, so maybe an oval. But we don't yeah. have the full outline of that. So we were using soil probes to. Um, because we, we're not going to excavate the whole thing. So we're using a probe to try to trace these um, these trenches. Um, but in that area, it was a little bit trickier. Things were just not not, not working out for us as the, it had in Feature 18. The hard surface d disappeared towards the edge. And yeah. So if there was a trench there, it was not showing up as well. Yeah. What he said. <laughs> Another question. There's one at the back. OK. I was wondering why Kino chose that area to establish a mission. Why did he choose it? Um, there were people already living there, um, and they chose that area <laughs> because the Santa Cruz was right there. <laughs> um, so, so Kino didn't uh, didn't choose where to establish missions. He just found existing um, communities of Altham ancestors and said, "Here, now you're a mission." Um, gave him a saint's name, and then all of a sudden they exist. No, they'd been there for generations before, and mainly because of the, the resources in the Santa Cruz Valley that was right there. So. I'm sure that the people living at the site were like, who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. And Los Santos Angeles de what? Yeah. <laughs> if the material's that hard, how did they dig the trenches and the post holes then? We don't know, and it's possible that they were there first and then the surface formed later, but we don't, yeah, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the relationship in Guavavi and Calabasas, and have, how much excavation has been done at Calabasas? Uh, there has been no excavation by archaeologists at Calabasas. The only thing that we've done is, is the site's been mapped, and the artifacts on the surface have, have been counted in squares and put back. Um, there was treasure hunting there, so I'm sure it's pretty badly damaged. Um, but yeah, there's not been a lot of work. Is it Cal safe to assume that, that Guavavi was the cattle area and Calabasas was maybe the fruits and vegetables <laughs> to supply to Macaquery? I don't know. No, um, most of the missions um, had sort of the full complement of, of agricultural production going on. Um, and they were far enough apart that, so they were both established in an existing community and um, uh, so they were sort of independent a bit in that way. Um, so yeah, they, they, each mission was supposed to be self-sustaining. Um, there probably would have been some commerce, and, but only for m more rare things perhaps, right? Rather than the sort of basics that they were expected to provide. So, and I should say Calabasas too was um, reused quite a bit, whereas Guavavi was not. And so the archeology span there would be a little bit more difficult. You know, we've got the Aki occupation after um, the Spanish colonial period at, at Guavavi, but that's it. Whereas Calabasas was used as a military outpost mm. and. I think a few other things. There as well. was a governor of Mexico purchased it and had a sheep ranching operation there. So it would be difficult to at Calabasas to really find identify that that mission occupation or more difficult. So. Okay, I think our next question is here. Are you uh, thinking that the place that you have marked on the map as artifact scatter is where the concentration of prehistoric inhabitants was? Um, and where is it? Yes, that's exactly correct. There's a, uh, on the top sort of area of the, of the map, there's a large area. Um, although we, we did do a one unit past feature 20 and did find prehistoric ceramics <laughs> below the ground there as well. So um, it's, there's, there's probably about this much soil that's been deposited on the site that's above the prehistoric component, so you really can't see it very well from the ground surface. Um, it, you know, ha having the road go through um, means that we can see it. I mean, archaeology is sort of funny in that way. The thing that is destroying the archaeological record is actually the thing that allows us to go out there and do this work and see what's on the surface. So if the road hadn't been going through, we wouldn't actually see these pit houses on the ground surface because they'd be, you know, two feet below the surface. But the road is cut through and, and basically excavated these, these pit yeah. houses for us. So they're totally visible right there on the road surface. But you get off the road surface and it's much harder to see anything. Um, if you're interested in visiting Guavavi, uh, Tumacacri National Historic Park has, I think, monthly tours that you can sign up for. And they park Starting rangers, in the fall. 
starting in the they fall. They just finished. Uh, and they can take you out there and show you the uh, site. And one aspect of all these post holes is that we put modern posts in them when we backfilled. And so the park rangers can take you and show you the corral area with all the posts sticking up. You won't be able to see the hard surface, but you'll be able to see <laughs> the posts sticking up. Um, at the peak of the mission, do you have any idea of how many people it supported and how that relates to two, three day walking uh, population? Um, the, the estimates that I've seen, we, we don't really have a firm census for Guavabi, um, but probably about 80 people were living there, maybe a little bit more um, at the height of the mission period. Um, and in terms of the, the Spanish attempted to kind of consolidate, it was called Reducción, um, everybody that they f was sort of under their, you know, proselytiz proselytization um, at missions. And so Calabasas and um, Guavavi and Tumacacari were occupied roughly at the same time, although they had different roles yeah, over time. So they would have been sort of the nearest community, the nearest Native American community would have been the other missions. Um, so most people, there were um, some groups that were living in the San Pedro River Valley that were not missionized, um, but most people, Native American people who are living in this part of the world were um, centered on their own communities that happened to be made into missions um, by Kino. And, and one thing you see during the course of the 40 or 50 years that uh, Guavavi was occupied were several epidemics came through, including a smallpox epidemic, I think in eight, 1746, that killed large numbers of people. So through time, there's a declining number of residents. I'm just wondering about any evidence of what, uh, of Apache, I mean, I don't know if there's distinctive um, projectile points or anything that could point to Apache presence. Uh, we know that the Apaches occasionally visited <coughs> Guavavi. Uh, social calls <laughs> called raids. <laughs> Um, and one aspect of having these uh, cattle pens and fences was if they could see the, uh, the Apache coming for a visit, they could herd their animals inside these enclosures and help protect them. Um, but we don't have any direct evidence of, um, uh, we have ethno-historical documents that indicate that there were raids, but we haven't found any archaeological evidence of, of Apache presence. We, we, we do find a lot of Piman arrow points at the site, and the faunal bone that was uh, identified from the one of the two units in the midden was like 99% domesticated animals. So they were not hunting very many animals with those arrow points. What could they have been using them for? <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Circumstantial evidence there. <laughs> yeah. This will probably be brief be because it falls outside your immediate area of excavation, but I'm interested in bee culture, and I notice the apiary uh, remains or residue or deposit. Can you tell us about bee culture in addition to animal culture? Um, I know absolutely nothing about that. <laughs> And w is that on the map somewhere? There, yeah, there is it on the map. There, oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, well. And there's an... It's over where Denny Samar was working. There's a oh. remains of beehives. Oh, but that's more it's recent. It's modern. Yeah, yeah, modern. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's modern. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I have a vague memory that I read something somewhere, and it could have been in La Florida, not here in the Pima Alta, of a, a missionary who was really interested in bees. Um, but it, I, it, my sense is that it was not something... If you had a missionary who, you know, a priest who was like really into that thing, they might have started it. But it, it doesn't seem to be something that was, um, uh, you know, sort of economically pushed at very many yeah. places. It was probably more like a gentleman's hobby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we know that they were importing sugar from Mexico City into the area, and I don't know if they would have imported honey. Yeah. Yeah. Next question here. Um, there's a B and B down there called Hacienda Corona de Guavavi. Where would it be on this map? Um, it's off the left-hand side. Yeah. And we actually uh, last year we had a little incident where we showed up at the site and there was this poor uh, pug dog that had been bitten by something and was lying there in a very bad condition. Puncture wounds. Puncture all wounds. Over. And he was dying. And so Barney made some phone calls, and we took the dog over to that bed and breakfast, and now that dog is happily living in the state of Maine. Yes. Yes. 
and doing quite well. Yeah. Trying to find his owner, but he has a new owner now. Well, if there are no more questions, I, I, I do have one question I've always wanted to ask a zooarchaeologist. Oh, God. And um, <laughs> coming over here to your ask dinner Chris. plate, <laughs> there's all these bones in here. So when you're eating dinner, do you like look at the bones and identify them? And can, can you turn off work or do you just no, eat dinner? No, no. And in fact, my, my dear spouse, who you know quite well, um, will not order food at restaurants if it comes on the bone <laughs> anymore. So. That's fantastic. And the worst thing you want to do is go out to dinner with, um, for chicken wings with a bunch of zooarchaeologists. So. Good to know. You'd be we, surprised how many zooarchaeologists are vegetarians, including me. I wouldn't be surprised yes. at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, right, Homer, is, his training is in zooarchaeology as well. Yeah. Very good. Thank you all for joining us tonight, as usual. Just fantastic yes. questions. Thank you, Thank you Burnett. Thank you, Homer.